Test. Test a new generation. You gotta go out. Know your faith. You gotta know it to share it. We have to let everyone know. Let me tell you about it. Share the faith. Don't you please. know that my faith is important to me? It's our test. We are the Destiny Generation. One of the biggest problems with our culture is we have no idea how to name dessert. <laughs> Do you have any idea how many desserts are named after Satan? Or described by images that sound like a theological treatise on the fall of humanity from grace in the Garden of Eden? Imagery of madness and sinfully sensational or devilishly decadent. Somewhere along the line, it stopped being a Sunday and became somebody's cookie fudge fantasy. <laughs> oh, cookie fudge fa Where did the, <laughs> used to be a Sunday. Like you had to read these descriptions, sinfully sensational, devilishly decadent peanut butter squares. <laughs> we'll put the sin back in cinnamon. You ever see kids' face light up? Or, oh, we're going to have devil's food cake. And they, ooh, devil's food. And they get all excited. I don't think because they like the flavor of the cake. I think because the name has devil in it. And so this must be extra good cake because the devil's fun. <laughs> Dark as a descriptive for chocolate is supposed to indicate a, a ratio of cocoa to milk, not the cake's stance toward God. And they make me feel like I'm going to betray my Jesus if I order dessert. That doesn't make me want to buy dessert. <laughs> now, what if, what if they had like the, you know, God made people and God made chocolate. And so God must really love people. So we call this one the big chocolate thank you. <laughs> well, now they made buying dessert something righteous. I'm totally getting dessert now. You know, but, but not if it's a sinfully sensational sticky bun. <laughs> like, what, what, it's no wonder we have the bad idea about God. I mean, our, our, obviously I'm embellishing and exaggerating to help it be funny. But there's no laughing matter at the point that's being made here is that our culture really does struggle with this. If they're not trying to do away with God, they're trying to demonize him. And then the reverse is going on, that the spoiler of all happiness is the one associated with anything fun. They've got it completely backwards. I love talking about the goodness of God. What a good daddy he is. He is a dear, dear daddy. He's so awesome. And I love talking about the reality of our God. As you know, apologetics is a big part of my own conversion to the faith. And I, I've fallen in love with it. And it's not just useful for defending your faith you know, to other people, which is great, like we were talking about yesterday, and, and some good apologetics, you know, evidences bolstering your faith, you know, evidence for the claims of Christianity and the gospel. Yes, that's great for talking to your friends, and I encourage you, pour into it so that you are ready to give an answer for the faith you profess, as Peter required, and always do so with gentleness and respect when you do so, like Peter also made clear. Great stuff for that. Apologetics, I've found, is also even more beneficial, I think. I know in my experience it's been even more beneficial to my own growth. Because when you start getting these evidences of the reality of this, it, it has this effect of helping you realize that this is true. It helps with that head-heart connection that we're talking about at Mass on Sunday morning. That connection between head and heart. Well, okay, I, I know this. I'm aware of it. I believe it. I've placed my faith in it. But then there's something different about going from that to, whoa, this is real. And apologetics, good apologetics can help do that for people. And there's so many ways to go about this. One, one way to do it is specifically Catholic apologetics to answer Protestants. And I talked a lot about these on Saturday night. I'll give you another one that we didn't mention. I said this to uh, a, a career professional in, in Baptist evangelical radio. He had the oldest running radio show of its kind in the country, used to be mayor of his town, you know, highly respected Baptist preacher. And I said to him, you know, the Pope is the single central unifying element of all Christianity. Catholic and Protestant alike. 
He said, no way. No, no, the Pope might be the central unifying element for Catholics, not for Protestants. How dare you? He got very upset. And I said, no, no, it's for, it's for both. Obviously for Catholics, because as the vicar of Christ, we submit to papal authority, but also for Protestants, because the rejection of the Pope's authority is the only doctrine that every Protestant agrees to. They will disagree on it. You'll find Protestants disagreeing about the Trinity. You'll find Protestants disagreeing about the gifts of the Spirit, disagreeing about eternal security, disagreeing about baptism, disagreeing about sacrament, disagreeing about marriage and morality and disagreeing about Christology and ecclesiology. But the one thing, the, the only thing they all agree to is the rejection of the Pope. It's the only thing unifying them. Therefore, the Pope remains the central unifying element for all of Christianity. <laughs> he told me that he's very troubled because he's thinking about becoming Catholic now, and then he gave me my own radio show. So really cool things. A lot of you have asked, like, what happened after you became Catholic? I became Catholic in 2004. God's still doing very cool stuff, and apologetics is still a very big part of it. Uh, another form of apologetics, defending the faith to academics. To academics. A lot of people think that smart goes along with faithless, and I don't understand that because the more I learn, the more it feeds my faith. And, and the more you reject faith, the, the more blind you have to be and the more unscientific you have to be. So I don't understand that, but it gives me plenty of chances to witness to academics. Like sitting in the classroom when a very anti-Catholic professor says to the class how much she loves anti-Catholic critics because the Catholic Church, she starts you know, spewing forth this acceptable prejudice, the Catholic Church is silencing voices. Every autonomous radical individualism needs to be heard. Every person has a right to their own truth. And the Catholic Church is silencing voices and voices should never be silenced. That's where I stand. Class, what do you think about anti-Catholic critics? And this brown noser raises his hand and says, anti-Catholic critics help fight against bigotry that the Catholics do. She goes, oh, that's wonderful, wonderful. She writes on the board, fights against bigotry. Anybody else? Another brown noser raises their hand. Anti-Catholic critics help fight against white male oppression and chauvinism. That's filled with, the, the Catholicism's filled with, she goes, oh, it's delicious, it's delicious. She writes on the board, fights against chauvinism. I'm like, I can't let this one go. Yes, Ian, that anti-Catholic critics contradict themselves. <laughs> Then she says, I'm not writing that on the board. <laughs> to which I responded, so you're silencing my voice? <laughs> Plenty of opportunities in that department. Same professor, different class, writes a statement on the board, says the entire message of Jesus can be reduced to a political teaching of helping poor people financially. That's it. And she says, in my entire career as a scholar, nobody has ever been able to show me otherwise, but I'll invite this class, even though it's never happened in 30 years of university teaching, I'll invite you to, can anyone contend with this statement? She puts it on the board. The whole message of Jesus can collapse into help the poor financially, period. Hand goes up, yes, Ian, I'd love to hear you try because it can't be done. I'm looking at her, looking at the class. I said, okay, what good is it if we save the poor man from his poverty while he remains enslaved to his sins? She says, oh my goodness, you just did it. <laughs> I didn't think it could be done. That was brilliant. I said, no, it wasn't. <laughs> I appreciate the compliment, but it doesn't apply. That wasn't smart. So yeah, defending the faith against academics, 
you know, th there's plenty, plenty of opportunity there. The Pope remains the central unifying element for all of Christianity. The more I learn, the more it feeds my faith. You can also defend the faith against accusations that God's word contradicts itself. Now, people think if they can find some place where the Bible says two different things, that they found a contradiction and they can throw out the whole thing as not being inspired or inerrant as we teach. Well, it is inspired, it is inerrant, and it doesn't contradict itself the way they think it does, and you can show them that. For example, this, this argument's been made. In Mark chapter 14, Bible tells a story where Peter denies Jesus and a rooster crows twice. John 18 recounts the same event, but says that the rooster crowed once. Same event. Mark 14, rooster crowed twice. John 18, rooster crowed once. We have a contradiction, therefore we can't trust the Bible. How can it contradict itself if it has errors in it? And here's how you respond and defend the faith. And apologetics just isn't just about defending the faith. Keep in mind, there's also an offense to it. The truth, you know, it, 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 we have the truth. So it's, we're not just on the defensive. You know, someone once said, you, you don't have to defend a lion. Just open up the cage. The lion will defend itself just fine. There's an offensive to this. This is the truth. We unleash the truth when we live Catholic lives. But anyway, the response to that argument, follow me on this. If a rooster crowed twice, it also crowed once. <laughs> you have to crow a first time in order to get to the second crow. <laughs> and forgive me for this, but... Uh, how many crows was that? Was that one three-syllable crow? Was that two crows, a two-syllable crow followed by a one-syllable crow? I don't know, because like you, I don't speak chicken. <laughs> but apparently these Bible critics are fluent speakers of roosteries in order to make a ridiculous, inane argument like this. What we have here is something that helps our cause. What we have is proof that we indeed have multiple eyewitnesses to the event. If every story read exactly from the, the same visual and auditory perspective, that would indicate they were all coming from the same source material. The fact that different people heard different parts and different people saw different parts of events shows that you had multiple eyewitnesses. This is called multiple attestation and it helps our cause. It doesn't hurt it. Another way you can show evidence defending your faith is to defend God's word against accusations that you can't trust it. It's 2,000 years old. You know, the New Testament's 2,000 years old, so maybe it got altered over the timeline. What if the wrong people got their hand on the Bible and fudged some stuff, made it say what they wanted to, changed this here, added this here, took this away here? How do you know you're reading the same thing that the eyewitnesses wrote? And that's the accusation. How do you know you can trust this 2,000-year-old document? The way any historian answers that question, and that was my major at Carnegie Mellon University, so I know a little bit about this. The way, what you have to do to answer that question is apply what's called the bibliographical test for historical reliability. Fancy words for a very simple idea. You look at two things. The number of ancient manuscripts that have survived history, like the oldest manuscripts. And you want a lot of those, you know, to show that, ah, it hasn't changed over the years. The other thing you look at is called a blackout period. It's the number of years that passed between when the authors wrote it and the date of our earliest copy of it. For example, Homer's Iliad. Homer's Iliad is an ancient document that has 643 ancient surviving manuscripts. That's a lot. That's good. Way to go, Homer. And only five centuries between when Homer wrote it, when Homer wrote the Iliad, and the date of our oldest manuscript copy. That's just five centuries that people could have fudged around with it. That's not a long time. So 643 manuscript copies and just a 500-year blackout period. That's Homer's Iliad. And that's considered the second most reliable ancient text in the world. The number one most reliable ancient text in the world is the New Testament, with over 5,000 ancient manuscript copies 
and no blackout period because our oldest manuscripts date back to the lives of the eyewitnesses themselves. So if somebody wants to say, well, how do you know you can trust the Bible? It hasn't changed over time. We know that it hasn't. Look at the evidence. And people aren't taught this. You think the enemy wants this getting out? But when you research and you want to know the truth, this is what you find. It's like God went out of his way for the skeptics and said, I would, I've got everything for you. Here it is. I mean, the, no blackout period, over 5,000 manuscripts. Or you can look at archaeology. I had a student in my class just last semester who fell away from the Catholic Church, left it, rejected it, and he wanted to go live a, a lifestyle of a rock and roll star with every, everything that comes with that. And he thought he'd you know, found himself in that. And, and his big issue was, is there any evidence outside the Bible that during the time of Moses, the people of Israel were conquered by Egypt? I mean, we know the Bible says that. You know, they were in a state of having been conquered by Egypt during the time of Moses. Hence, Moses had to leave, lead them to their freedom. But does anything outside the Bible say that? Do we have any archaeology that says that? Now, what I didn't like about this idea was that if the Bible says it, it's suspect, right? If church tradition says it, it's suspect. But if archaeology says it, it's firm. Come on. The Bible's reliable. That's a valid historical document. And as if every archaeologist is a perfect human being with no bias and no sin and no evil, how come archaeology is hailed as this end-all, be-all, trustworthy source, but if the Bible says it, I gotta throw it out. That's not fair. He's not being objective, he's not being scientific, he's not being intelligent about it. But the answer to his question was yes, we have the Merneptah inscription, which absolutely confirms that during the time of Moses, Israel was a conquered people under, Egy under Egyptian reign. The guy re-entered the church. He came back, like that was his issue. And once it was solved, back into the church he comes. We've got the Cyrus Cylinder. We've got the inscription about King David. How do we know King David was real? Only the Bible talks about it. Again, there's that prejudice. Only the Bible, we need it from some trustworthy source. You mean some other perfect human being who wrote something else? But it's there. We have it inscribed onto something by another country that King David was king of Israel right when the Bible says he was. There's over 5,000 of these. Archaeological finds that confirm what the Bible said. Or you can get into other manuscripts to say the same thing the Bible says. Well, and, and again, that prejudice, you know, well, how come it doesn't say this stuff happened outside the Bible? Well, it does, but it doesn't need to. The Bible already says it. We have four gospels. Isn't that enough? Multiple attestation, but some people, the, the, this, Oftentimes, what the, what's driving the skeptic is not seeking the truth. What's driving the skeptic is they are bothered by the possibility that there's a God. Because if God's God, then they're not. And they have a vested interest in playing God over their lives. So they don't want this to be true. And that's what's driving it. Because in the face of all this evidence, they'll still reject it. If you throw out the New Testament, you have to throw out all of the Caesars. And then nobody wants to do that in history class, but then they want to throw out the Bible. But the point is, there are other documents that say the same thing. The writings of Tacitus, the writings of Heracles, the writings of Josephus. There are other ancient historians alive at the time of Jesus who confirm Jesus was here, that people talked about him coming back from the dead, that they performed miracles. Writings in the Berela call Jesus a sorcerer. Now, why would they call him a sorcerer? Well, because they're non-believers. You know, they were Jews who didn't accept Jesus Christ, but they couldn't deny the miracles, and they explained it as witchcraft. They explained it as sorcery, but the point is they could not deny what they saw. Heracles confirms Peter and Paul's sorceries. Again, because they performed miracles, and here's a non-Christian confirming, yeah, these guys worked miracles. They must have been warlocks. Thallus and Phlegon both confirmed that after the crucifixion, darkness covered the earth. They explain it as a solar eclipse. But we know that a solar eclipse doesn't cause earthquakes 
and that a solar eclipse didn't happen when they thought it. it was their only explanation. They had to explain it away because they were non-believers, but there was this miraculous, unexplainable, mysterious darkness that fell on the land at Jesus' crucifixion, as we know from the Bible, confirmed from two non-Christians, saying, like, this, this is scary. It must be a solar eclipse. One of the most chilling things I ever read, this eyewitness account of the crucifixion from a non-believer trying to explain it away with something we know doesn't explain it. He actually gave more, more examples of the earthquakes that followed, the shaking earth, the toppling buildings. Solar eclipses don't make buildings fall down and open the earth up. The, the father's reaction to the death of his son on our behalf, that might open up the earth. <laughs> When you can show that the Bible predicted something and it came true exactly, that's powerful. We unleash the truth when we live Catholic lives. You can also look at fulfilled prophecy. Now, I've got to put a big disclaimer out here. There is more to prophecy than predictions coming true. It's not just oracle and then it comes true and it's cool. And it's not a crystal ball. It's not a psychic hotline. Prophecy does not equate to prediction. Prophecy is about the proclamation of the will of God for God's people. However, because God is the author of time and stands outside the timeline and intersects the timeline, he can do all of that. Sometimes when God speaks his will, it involves things that haven't happened yet. So there is a predictive element to certain prophecies. And for apologetics, that's wonderful. When you can show that the Bible predicted something and it came true exactly, that's powerful. And that's, that's very convincing to the skeptic who's honestly seeking the truth. My favorite kind of fulfilled, I mean, you could talk about, you know, the fall of Nineveh, uh, the fall of Jericho. You could talk about the fall of Tyre. You could talk about Israel becoming a country again, which was fulfilled in 1948. And we're talking in our, in our own era, we got to see this prophecy fulfilled. For years, people said, ah, oh, the Bible can't be true. It talks about Israel being a nation, and there's no Israel anymore. Yes, until it became a nation again. In 1948, we get to see that one fulfilled in our own day and age. But my favorites are the prophecies about God's promised agent to the world, the anointed one, the Messiah, the Christ, the one who was promised to Eve that one day a human will crush the head of the serpent. The new head of the human race, the firstborn from among the dead, the God-man who did what we couldn't on our behalf. His promised saving agent of his love on our behalf, the Christ. And so that we would know who this was, there are over 400 references to this figure in the Old Testament, all of them fulfilled in Jesus Christ. All of them. Everyone. Prophecies that he couldn't have helped, like where he was born. Micah 5, 2, the Christ will be born in Bethlehem of Judea. How could baby Jesus in Mary's womb say, come on, mom, we got to get to Bethlehem to make it look like I'm the anointed one. <laughs> he can't help where he's born. Psalm 22, his hands and feet would be pierced. A description of Roman crucifixion centuries before there was a Roman Empire. Isaiah 53's description of him being betrayed by his own people and being wounded for our transgressions. Uh, the descriptions in Isaiah 53 are so specific to what happened to Jesus centuries later that Bible critics accused Isaiah 53 of being written after the events that people lied that it was part of Isaiah and this prediction because it's too accurate. That's impossible. So it must have been written after the events. It's too close to the events. Before there was even a Roman Empire. It's, the, the, the descriptions are too accurate. It's impossible. As so I said, it must be an interpolation. It must have been added after the fact in a dishonest way to make Christianity look true. And what they used to back this up was the fact that our oldest manuscript of Isaiah 53 in the Old Testament came from the Leningrad Codex. The Leningrad Codex dates to 1,000 years after Jesus. So if this guy's accusation is right, there's no way for us to know. Our oldest manuscript is a millennia after the events until the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls, where there was a copy of Isaiah 53 that dated to 500 BC. 
and it reads verbatim what you read in your Bible today. 500 years before the events, and it shut the critics up. That's why the Dead Sea Scrolls were such a significant find for apologetics, because it shut up so many critics. And nobody can explain how Isaiah 53 could have such an accurate description of Jesus' experience five centuries before Jesus' birth. Even Islam confirms that Jesus was born of a virgin. It even, Islam even confirms Jesus' ascension into heaven based on the histories. The fulfilled prophecies just blow my mind. Zechariah 12. Amos 8, 9 predicts that at, at, that at the Messiah's death, darkness would cover the earth. So here we have a prophecy, not just fulfilled in Jesus, not just fulfilled in the New Testament, but backed up by non-Christian historians who saw it and talk about it and explain it away by an eclipse. There's so much out there. If somebody's seeking a reason to stay the way they are, they'll find that. If somebody's seeking a justification for their lifestyle, they'll find that justification. If someone's seeking to be right, they'll find ways that they're right. If somebody's seeking an excuse to stay the way they are, they will find that excuse. Seeking rationalization, seeking justification, seeking excuses, you find what you seek. But if someone is seeking the truth, honestly, they want to know what's reality, no matter what it means for their life, that's different. Because those who seek the truth find it. And Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And there is plenty there for the true seekers. What's driving the skeptic is they are bothered by the possibility that there's a God. Because if God's God, then they're not. So they don't want this to be true. <laughs>